FIT Talks is the oral history program of the Fashion Institute of Technology. Today, June 12, 2017, we are taping at the headquarters of the Notori Company in New York City with Mrs. Josie Notori. Since 1977, Josie Notori has built a major fashion business of lingerie, sleepwear, clothing, legwear, home, and accessories that is sold worldwide. The brand has a distinctive aesthetic and reputation for beauty and quality that revolutionized the lingerie business while also showcasing the unique beauty and skill of Philippine craftsmanship. Mrs. Notori works very hard in leading the Notori company while also serving many charities and educational institutions. She provides inspiration for understanding hands-on entrepreneurship and fashion creativity. Among her many awards are the Galleon Award in 1988 presented by the President of the Philippines and the Humanitarian Award from the Fashion Group International. So I will begin by asking Mrs. Notori about her childhood and education. Can you tell us how did your upbringing influence your life as an entrepreneur? Thank you. I um, really appreciate being part of this program. Uh, I had a very fortunate uh, upbringing. I come from the Philippines, which is a very entrepreneurial environment. And specifically, I come from a family of um, entrepreneurs. My father was a self-made man. My grandmother was really an amazing entrepreneur and, and, and uh, a feminist at the same time. <laughs> and all her children had careers and were had their own businesses. My mother also you know, worked from day one, working alongside building the company with my father. So I came in an environment that there was not a question that I would go into business and that women work and you can be whatever you want to be. Yes, and I also understand that uh, you went to Catholic school and I, I know there are other people like Geraldine Stutz who, who mentioned that she got a sense of service from her Catholic education that also contributed to her DNA. Yes, well, um, glad you mentioned that my, you know, uh, Philippines is 86% um, Catholic and I grew up where, you know, my grandmother went to Mass every day and I would go with her when I would spend the summers and clearly Sunday Mass was, you know, absolutely and all the Christmas, uh, all the, you know, the holidays. But also we were always surrounded with clergy, nuns and priests and to this day my, my mother's best friends are my clergy. And so giving back, helping the church and, you know, was always something that uh, I grew up with where my grandmother's home and my mother's home were always someplace where we would have lunches and dinners with people from the church yes. and going to school. There was not a question. That's all I've ever experienced was going to a school with nuns. Okay. And some of them must have inspired you also. Very much. And, you know, I went to the actually schools that were run by um, origin from the United States. First, the, uh, um, they were... The first nuns were from, I forget now, the congregation, but it was the College of the Holy Spirit, Holy Ghost, and then the next one were Mary Knoll, so they were from here. And my college was Manhattanville here, which were the Sacred Heart nuns, where clearly they, they really drove in about women being, you know, excelling and uh, being an independent person. So I've been very lucky in my life that everywhere I had role models and examples and uh, never any limitations put in front of me. Yes. So then um, after, after college, you uh, began working in the financial industry. So, uh, but at some point you, 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 you decided to leave that. Do you want to tell us about how that came about? Yes. Well, I um, had always knew that I'd go into business the way my grandmother was, my mother, my father. I mean, that was never a question. It's a question of what business. And my first exposure was really Wall Street, the stock exchange. So I had this fantasy of being in Wall Street. And sure enough, I spent 
nine wonderful years in Wall Street, um, and it was a, an amazing experience. But towards the end, I just realized that there was, the, the, you know, I was not having the same kind of satisfaction or reward or challenge, and it was really an issue that I always knew that you know, at that time I was finally after towards the last uh, um, three years of my Wall Street career. Ken and I married, who is also uh, uh, in Wall Street, and we always knew that we would have our own business. That's the way I grew up. You go into business and you have your own business, just like my father did, just like my grandmother did. But it was a question of what, and we actually thought of going into a stock brokerage business, but it was not the right time in the early 70s, in the mid 70s, and I decided that after so many hundred ideas of businesses that included a car wash, a McDonald's franchise, et cetera, et cetera, that having something to do with the Philippines made sense, and that's how it all kind of unfolded that I started to look at different products from the Philippines and experimented in baskets, experimented in furniture, and then ultimately when these beautiful blouses were sent to me with embellishment, you know, I thought I'd take a chance and show it to some buyers and lo and behold, you know, someone said make it into a nightshirt and that's really the beginning of Natori. I mean, it was just the idea of buying and selling, it wasn't any lofty idea of coming out with a concept and all of that, but it was based on beautiful craftsmanship from the Philippines. Right, and I, I read also that was about the same time that the Victoria's Secret Company also, you know, came about, I, I, I don't know, maybe. Yes, I mean, at the time we started, there was a Victoria's Secret store oh, in okay. San Francisco. It was actually a customer of ours. Uh -huh. This is before Les Wexner bought it. And, uh, but at that time was the um, time when Saint Laurent was really big in terms of the Russian look. That was that Russian time in his, uh, you know, uh, in, in, in his various yeah. collections. and. The embroideries we had just really resonated so much to uh, these buyers we're dealing with because it was so fashion. And I guess, you know, I was bringing an element into a very sleepy industry that it was very either basic or it was tacky, <laughs> you know. Yes. So, so were you um, interested in clothes? And uh... you know, I. Um, have always been a, being the oldest child. I'm the oldest of six children, my mother, and the oldest of 32 grandchildren. I, I, um, I guess I, in, in a way, probably I was showered clothes, being the first grandchild. I was very close to my grandmother, and and I liked dressing up, you know. And um, so, yes, and I was a, I, I, I like. I like to dress, but also my mother liked to dress, my grandma, so that was kind of in the jeans, <laughs> to always look good. You were kind of, so even in Wall Street, it was, but I never, absolutely ever had any fantasy nor desires nor any dreams of being in the industry. I'm a pianist at heart. I've been playing the piano since I was four, and so I guess that's the artist in me, but never in a million years did I think I would end up in the business I'm in. Right. So um, you've spoken about how you um, brought uh, some embroidered shirts to, to a buyer, and they were, it, uh, this person was impressed and told you to make it a little longer or to change it somehow. How did you, did you, were you the, the uh, sort of, eye of the company, the aesthetic eye of the company, or did you hire uh, someone? Well, clearly in the beginning, as I, you know, I was fortunate enough that I, I love clothes. I have an, I suppose I wouldn't say I had a great eye, but I had an eye for yes. beautiful things and fashion. And, and so this blouse that I showed was a short blouse where she said, make this you know, night shirt, she described to me, a night shirt, just make it longer. And I said, a night gun, just even make it to the floor. So that's my introduction to lingerie, because up until then, it was not a department I went into. 
wow. you know. And um, so how did I go about it? I mean, to me, that's what I think was the lucky part of it, I guess, that I did it intuitively, instinctively. No one taught me or said to me, oh, this is what you do, this is what you do. So I was doing, I was my own model. And, and um, I don't mean modeling for fit, but just whether I like it or not, because at the end of the day, you know, if I didn't like it, it wasn't going in. So that, that direction and that um, comment just kind of that, okay, you know, as a, at the end, to me, it's a business, and I saw an opportunity that someone likes something, you know, like fashion services, right? You have to have a product that somebody likes. And so I decided, let's build around this and about embellishment. And so in the beginning, I, when she said, oh, okay, uh, I did that for that, but then I realized there should be a collection. And at that point, when I realized that I had something there that I, I kind of like, I said, okay, it gave me the impetus to, at that point, to really be serious about this. And so it was only then that I quit Wall Street. Up until then, I was just experimenting and, and then decided it was time to show a, I don't remember how big the collection was, maybe 16 pieces, 18 pieces, but they were all based on embellishment. So, so what did I do? I don't know. I think I asked a friend, can you just help me? And so, and uh, we, I actually went myself to the Philippines and had things made and with a friend of mine who had a factory and nothing original, do this, do that. You know, it's just kind of playing in these bodies and uh, not from any study nor research, but just instinctively, their clothes. And that's why from this to this day, Natori wasn't, you know, I don't have any preconceived idea what a nightgown is or a nightshirt or cami and all of that, their clothes just happened, some people sleep in it. And so 40 years later, that's what the tour is about. It's just a, you know, clothing that is feminine and soft, has artisanship, do whatever you want to do it, including sleeping in it. Um, so that's how it happened. And in, in a way, I would say that I uh, probably was fortunate that I was learning it on the job. If you know too much, sometimes then, you know, I listened. If a buyer said to me, would you do this, would you do that? I just said yes. They were probably so happy to have someone just following whatever they wanted. I did that every store. And, and to this day, I believe you have to listen to your customer. So it's just learning with the job, doing it instinctively, and making mistakes. But it doesn't matter. At the end, if they like it and they bought it, and it was really easy in the beginning yes. because it was they literally were clothes. They were all cotton with embroidery, with scallops. They were all, with, you know. Um, and I think we were bringing something that was just so different at that time. They, nothing looked sleepy. They were clothes. They just happened to be short and long, but they were easy. Yes. And listening to the buyers, I think you've mentioned in some of your interviews, the buyers, they, who bring their knowledge of customers and what sells. Uh, so that, that was fortunate that you uh, had terrific buyers uh, that you worked with. Yes, you know, I, I am a very curious person. And when it's like having a, what is that expression? And you go, you know, your nose and you follow. I, I, I want to learn. And I was very fortunate that all these people, I mean, this in particular, this amazing buyer at Bloomingdale's called Lee Fabry, who was so amazing. She is literally, she's the one who baptized it Natori, you know, because I thought, oh, that's so presumptuous, what to call this brand. Because I was, as far as I was concerned, I was making it and then selling it. Right? And, but she opened up the door to just say, oh, you know, no, this, there's a concept to this. But I think it's listening, learning, because I didn't know anything. I mean, I literally know anything. So I literally, I had people and I was willing to listen, learning the steps. And later, later on, I formed my own opinion. But in the beginning, you just learn as much as you can from different, because from the very beginning, we had Bloomingdale, Saks, Neiman, all the stores. So I just think that, I, I suppose my coming from Wall Street didn't hurt, that they thought I was really serious about it. I wasn't just playing or not serious about the business. And uh, it, it was just a wonderful collaboration that, that 
you know, here is a new person who is willing to. We were already showing something different. It was something fresh. Basically, it was bringing fashion, bringing color, yes. you know, which I thought was normal because I didn't know that prior to that the laundry department was white, pink, and blue. That's right. I was bringing the first color uh, uh, col uh, collection we have had bright orange, almost this color in cotton rami with embroidery. How do I know? There was a skirt, if you can believe it. And there was a big peasant blouse, and it's like, you know, they were literally clothes. It's like, let's say, lounge or things that you'd go, oh, but I had no boundaries because no one told me. It's just, okay, whatever. I would wear that, right? So fine. So it went in there. Yes, in one of the articles that you shared with me, you mentioned that in the Philippines, women wear clothes at home that they then could go outside in. Very much. My grandmother actually always wore long, what you would call maxi dresses today, except they were covered. She wore that conducting office all day long, going to church in the morning, conducting office all day, all the way to the night, until she changed her nightgown. Talk about multi-purpose, and that she was dressed, to, you know, she was dressed. She was proper, you know. So it's comfortable because it's the tropics, right? She literally, and she had her mules, low mules. So I had great examples that I guess I, I didn't have this boundaries of you only wear this in the morning, you wear this after 12, you wear this after 5, and this is for nighttime. That's not the background we came from. You bring clothes that are feel good, comfortable, and beautiful, yes. and fits you, right? So, so yes. it's not this, I think, the industry I got into, I never realized such division and such fragmentation. Yes. And they have every label for every garment from after five, between four and six, breakfast thing, lunch thing, sportswear. You know, not, women don't think that way. Gimmick, right? Not today, right? Right. So from the beginning, I never had those boundaries or all that hang-ups. Yes. And also the 70s was the beginning of the breakdown of the uh, dress codes. Correct, yes, yes, a, a, a bit. I, I wasn't conscious so much then, but you, you're right. But, um, you know, it, it's, you know, I came here in the 60s, 64, so it's been an interesting journey right. through here. And I think today women have come a long way, clearly, from the way we used to buy or dress then. That's right. Um, You've also... Uh, mentioned how important uh, it's been having working with your husband as the financial officer. And I've read a number of Fern Malice's interviews with other uh, company heads, and they mention how important having a strong financial officer is to the... Well, there's no question that we would not have been able to Grow this in the way it was in the 80s if my husband did not. He really left Wall Street then, a very successful career in Wall Street, to kind of help me. Now, this is not, he, he always says, it's, it's your business, you know. I mean, it's, he is a deal guy, he's a Wall Street guy, but at, I was doing it, you know, myself from 77 to 85, but then to go to the next thing, it was. It was helpful. No matter what you just say, there's just you can't only do so much. And so his presence, whether dealing with the banks at that point as we were expanding, whether it's your lines or just even the camaraderie, you know, no matter what you say, there's a lot of the guys who roll up. <laughs> you know, it's, it does exist. It's okay. You know, and just being realistic of, of division of labor. So that kind of helped in cementing and, and, and just having a balance. So and it was also very helpful having a partner who, I mean, I, of course, coming from finance, understood it too, but I got more into the whole image and all of that. So in a way, it was helpful to have a partner there who um, kind of helped in expanding. I mean, but he never really, he, uh, you know, Ken was always like, had this uh, attitude that, you know, that I would, you know, he's there to partner, but not there to put stop. So he's, been amazingly supportive and couldn't really uh, do it 
if he had not been there during that time. So when it was more stable, then, then he went back to his doing his deals. So it, but it was just the right time in the 80s when, he, when we were really knew that the business was stable and we were ready to expand. And that was extremely you know, invaluable. Right, I just probably the companies that don't have that financial expertise that you know feel maybe the lack. So, um, uh, but it's uh, it's it's interesting because you have Calvin Klein, credit Barry Schwartz, okay. someone who knew since high school, BJ, right. right? So that's. There are many examples of that. I mean, I, I think that I'm fortunate I have, do have a left brain and a right brain, yeah. but it kind of helps. Even today, you know, Kenneth is a more right brain <laughs> in stopping the finance. You know what I'm saying? So it, it's helpful to have someone who can balance you so that you are able to do what you do best and, and having that other factor that kind of... Yes. Right. So... Um, How has the customer changed from the customer because the from world has years? changed oh so my much. God oh my God a really quite amazing um, in 40 years how it changed I mean in so many factors you know I think and not necessarily bad it's just it is what it is you know it's just dealing with it and making sure you have the you know the kind of strategy and products and processes to be able to to succeed in the next um, you know the next 40 years I would say that when I when 40 years ago um, you know just the woman alone I mean we were much more not so independent in terms of decision making we were more like oh you are this if the editor says this that I mean we were, we were all like maybe fashion victims, maybe not today. So the psychographic of the woman today is very different today. More independent, we're more people working out there, and you know, we want things that work for us, not to be dictated on. So already you have that called change, right? People are very busy, so life is very different. It's not like, that's why there's no need for these categories that Oh, you only wear that is after five. Remember that category after five or there's a sport. That's like, it's so irrelevant. It makes yeah. no sense. Yeah. People want to do multi-purpose, want to do things that work for them, day to night, travel, seasonless. Who the heck has the time to kind of change the wardrobe all the time, you know, and then with the sweater. So it's a, that is a big change. The, the, the psychographic of the consumer today. Then you have the mentality of the new generation where it's very different, their lifestyle, you know, Candace generation and even the younger have a different uh, point of view about life than they did or my parents, right? So, so I think it's more not thinking about, you know, it's just very different, you know, in terms of what's important. And I think there was a lot of acquiring, acquiring in our thing now. It's very different. It's like enjoying the, all the experience right or they wanted the instant instant the even younger one then they just rent they don't have to own it okay but I think the biggest changes honestly is the internet the whole digital world that has changed the world you know I would say single-handedly that has been the game changer and it's going faster than we can even manage or handle the whole technology I think that but it can be for the good but if you're kind of behind, it's really, you know, it's, it's, it's a challenge. I, um, I would say that today everything is transparent. You can have so your pricing, your visibility, so I'm comparing. And it's like, you know, it, it, it's harder in a way. But yet there's opportunities there because in a minute you can sell to the world. You have to figure just how to get it to them. And at what price? So, so I think it has its, you know, many good points. But for sure, that is a game changer in terms of how you do business today, and you know, faster. You know, the you have to be able to get, get to your customer faster where she wants it and when she wants it, right. at the price she wants it. Right. Yeah. So, so big change, big change, and there are less stores today. 
Amazon has changed the world. Alibaba is another one, you know. It doesn't mean stores are dead. It's yeah. just, you know, I think right. it's a different landscape. Yeah, but it's almost a full circle where stores, where specialty stores where they knew you and you could immediately find something that you like. That happens online now. People know exactly what they see when they see something and they want it. Yeah, so. Online, yeah, I suppose. And then they feel like they have the comfort of having them in their home and they can try it. I still believe that's never going to go away. But there are some people, you want to see it. I mean, there's a combination. I think it's just a balance. I think it's a balance of how many brick and mortars. It's still not going to compensate for all the, you know, right. business. 100% cannot just be done on Yes, on and you have internet. an international business. Right? Yes, yes, yes. I mean, we are still very, you know, I would say a lot of opportunity and still underdeveloped in that. I mean, we do sell to a number of countries, and, uh, but it's our focus now. I mean, I think that the last decade we've been very focused on, 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 on refining the different brands we have, the Josie Natori, the Natori, the Enatori, and the Josie, so that we can hit different kind of, there's price points, but demographics and kind of lifestyle too. But now really um, uh, just really getting other distribution partners. We have one in Japan, we have one in the Philippines. So it's just a question of, of now getting the right you know, um, strategic partners in each country. But through the internet too, we can be more global. And I know that Kenneth has kind of working, we're working with companies who will allow us to be able to deliver um, effectively Abroad, you know, I mean, with our limited resources, we, we, you know, we're working on being there, you know, and not, you know, a few steps, you know, and not, not behind the, the eighth ball. Yeah. yeah. One of the things I've noticed because I went to your boutique and I went oh, to, you did. to Saks, there is um, an immediate aesthetic impression of, of your. Oh. of your clothing. It's, you know, it's, it's beautiful and the quality is, is fantastic um, and I, I could see how it would have an appeal. Mm. I mean, it appealed to me and I've never thought about <laughs> buying an expensive oh. piece of lingerie until I went <laughs> there. You know, and so I, I, I gather that's part of your understanding of this yes. uh, niche oh, to some thank degree. Thank you. That, that pleases me to hear that, honestly. Um, I think we take such great pride on the, you know, the artisanship and the quality of our clothes. But aesthetically, I mean, we are fortunate that, you know, the one distinguishing mark of the brand is the East-West sensibility. And as we say, we try to bring art into life. And it's all originating from my love of art, my travels. It's bringing the world into someone's life. That you don't have to go to Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan, and Turkey, and all of that. And bringing all that beautiful workmanship and that you could find sometimes just in museums, if you can find, you know. And then translating them. And, you know, it's not just necessarily duplicating them, but be inspired from that. In some cases, it could be very in the traditional way, but then it can be also interpreted in a modern way. But bringing the essence of that to your life that is, that works, that's relevant, that, that, that you can wear or you can surround yourself with, put in your bed um, and, and put in the accessories. So I, I do believe that that has that, East-West sensibility has gives us a very distinct trademark that from you know it you know that's what the notori is about that you know that makes us different from other designers and um, take great pride in that I mean you know and even try to flaunt it now to some people it might be oh it's too Asian well yeah that doesn't mean everything looks Asian but for sure it's there so you either like it or you don't but hopefully to be around 40 years later, there's something about it that people like because it's like a treasure. It's special. We obsess and work so hard on prints to bring it to life. And embellishments are really with love, that craft. And so I think people look at it as collectibles, special. Sometimes I meet women who have it for 30 years. I said, well, please throw it away. They don't want to throw it away. 
Something that's polyester, they think, is silk because it feels like that. So in some ways, I think we've developed, you know, gratefully through the years, a, a loyalty of women who have enjoyed wearing it and treasure that whether they got it when they were engaged or their wedding or it was a gift to them by a husband or gift by their, by their mother, they treasure that. Now we need to make it part of their everyday life, not just special, but I think lingerie has a way of having that emotional connection with women, right? It's, yes. it's, it's very personal. Yes. It's the you know, thing to your skin, whether it's the bra, and my goodness, just in the underwear alone, when women just stop me in the street, oh my God, you know, you have no idea, you know, that it's the most comfortable thing they feel like I have not, I mean, that thrills me because I, I think that's why I love the business, when you are able to create things that make a woman feel good, and then they feel rewarded, and they love it, and it makes them feel glamorous. Isn't that rewarding? That's wonderful. Right? Nothing could be better. <laughs> yes, yeah, so, but to do it over and over again. <laughs> and that's, you know, that's clearly, I love the challenge, and I love the journey. Yeah, so do you, uh, do you design your own uh, prints and textiles? Oh my God, yes, everything here is original. Yes, I mean, we get inspired with things, and then, a print can be obsessed in here, swear to God, minimum three months. You know, we have more meetings here than you think we're doing a concert. It's really crazy, you know, everyone's opinion. It's, it's, it's so, it's so um, much work and just painstaking because we obsess on that color, her, that shade there, that, that there, the combination, how it flows from one month to the next. And, you know, it, it's been the hallmark, you know, and so when you see prints in the stores, white looks like that, we worked at it. You know, it's like creating an, a symphony. You want the, you know, from the first movement to the last movement, they all need to tell a story. There's a story for the season that doesn't come by just like slapping in the CAD machine and doing, no. That is so deliberate and that going back and forth and a lot of back and, you know, work, a lot of work. Right. Expen and expense. <laughs> and also, um, you've mentioned, and I know that uh, you were very interested in uh, building factories in the Philippines quite soon after you began. Uh, yes. Yes. And well, would you talk about that yeah. and how? Well, I, in the beginning, I was just doing it from the factory of friends, then I got this first order. First order we got really was from Saks Fifth Avenue. And uh, it was Bloomingdale's idea, but Saks was the first to buy. But Bloomingdale's bought right after that. But it was Saks was the first we had um, 40 years ago first. Um, but I think that um, in the beginning, I was learning on the job. So when got the order, so we were just working with um, people that we knew had factories there. So after a few years, um, you know, I when realized that it was there, there, there was there, there was a um, legs to this, you know, um, and I think my father felt sorry for, because I would be doing the quality control till four or five o'clock in the morning and having production issues and all of that, and so so built a little just something, you know, one. One, one, one property, and you know, happy to say that 37 years later, the factories we now have two different factories with over 600 people. So it was fortuitous, and honestly, it's that control of the production and the quality and having our own production that has kept us where we are. It would not be possible to do what we do and bring consistently the artisanship and that quality and the variety because the collection is enormous, bigger than we should have, I'm sure. But that's part of what people have come to expect from us. We're constantly bringing newness and all that. We could not, never have done that in the variety we have, in the quantity we have, in the frequency that we did if we did not have our own manufacturing facilities. So it has been a great asset and the 
Philippine hands are really special. You know, we were under the Spain for 350 years, so we had the influence of so many different um, countries that have given the hand a, a different touch, you know, and, and a care, and a care. So I'm very proud of that. Yes. Um, and I know um, you also, uh, I guess, to, to, um, to pull this together, uh, we, we should ask you about your, uh, your charity work and your educational initiatives, because I read a long list of boards that you're on. and Well, that's been pared down a bit, but, but um, thank you. Well, I think when you come from a country like the Philippines where, you know, I mean, the poverty is still quite a large percentage. And, you know, I, of course, I take great pride that we've been able to give jobs to a lot of people and women. So it's not just the women working in our factories, mostly women, but they're men too, but um, also the subcontractors outside in the field. So, so that, I think, is the beginning, is being able to you know, provide jobs for some, making something that we can all be proud of. But you know, through the years, as I said, my influence from my, my parents, my grandmother, the giving back and better sharing, it's something I have always had the fantasy that this is just a means to an end, that what I'm doing is not the end, you know. And so that's part of, um, you know, other than giving jobs, just, you know, helping and uh, in the education. Um, clearly, I enjoyed many years being on the foundation board of FIT and, and being um, in the critics class and all of that because I feel that's very important giving back um, and being a mentor where you can and inspiring and we have a lot of students uh, who've come in here as uh, interns or we've hired, I mean my you know, designer who's been here with me for 39 years came from FIT. Another one here has been here for 18, I think she's here now, 19. 18 years came from FIT also, so so I think that get back, you know, just that um, being there in the schools and, and teaching them what you know, particularly, you know, then at the same time in the, you know, in, in the Philippines, um, so many of the people there really are so hungry to know more about design and how they can make it, so I had formed a, like a CFDA there, Way back, uh, actually, it is um, almost um, tw 20 years that I formed, like, and it's called the uh, Fashion and Design Council of the Philippines. And these are all these young designers, and it represents the designers and it does into a competition. And then they're also, you know, when the government wants something, so it's a way of representing the designers and giving them a voice. So I've tried to do where I can in part since. Um, for the last 20 years to, to be a voice for the designers, helping them, mentoring them, I'm helping them in a trade show that's like a trade show there, like Maison, um, Maison uh, Auger in Paris. They have a, there's a trade fair that happens twice a year and it's been mostly for accessories and home, but we started about 10 years ago to form an apparel, but I wanted to call it Manila Wear. And this, Kind of helping the, the, you know, the kids. I guess they're kids. <laughs> learn what is making a collection, you know. So, so I think all that which I really enjoy. Um, I'm very involved in the arts. I'm a, a vice chair of the Asian Cultural Council, um, where we give grants for artists all over, both from here and Asia. It was founded by John D. Rockefeller and. And we raise money for that, and for, you know, and it really has a lot to do with Asian and American cultural exchange, and that's so gratifying to just see. We, we have very famous, you know, artists now who were our grantees, you know, uh, 50 years ago. So then, I'm, you know, I'm on the board of the Orchestra of St. Luke. So I think it's important about all of this, where you can not just giving money but being able to have a voice and helping it make its mission. So it's having that balance you do in between. And of course, 
you know, in our industry, wherever is help, whether it's a disease here or, or a catastrophe there, you know, we all kind of come to, to, uh, to help and contribute. Um, this has been a, a wonderful interview. I think um, it's, it will be very inspiring for young people to, to hear this because many, there are many people all over the world who want to start a bus businesses like yours and to be able to, to understand that it is possible and what it, and what it, what it entails is, is, is wonderful. Yes, well, I, I would say that, that to so many that if I can do it, you can do it. You know, but you have to have that passion, you have to have that curiosity, you have to have that tenacity, and you have to be willing to work very hard, and you have to be willing to make mistakes. You know, but it, yeah, it takes all that. Of course, it, you know, the money factor is not a small thing. But given that you can have all that, but I've seen people too make a break. I mean, when I see people who've done it on a, and they were able to sell the concept to somebody. So I, I think that that's what's great about there's always room for a new idea. And if the fact that me, having zero background in the industry, with no reference, nobody said, OK, here, why don't you talk to Josie? That I kind of did it on a cold call, was able to break through an industry. That, you know, doesn't mean it was easy. It was easy in the beginning, but and still be around 40 years later, it's possible for a lot of people to do that. So it's just. You know, I, I was lucky, but it's a lot of work, but it's a, it's a great field to be in if you love it, you know. Um, it, it really is, and I am grateful to be still around 40 years later. That's great. Thank you so much for giving us your time today. Thank you. Thank you for having me.